In this next series of presentations, we're going to take a careful look at a controversial passage in the history of the church, and that is James chapter 2, 14 to 26. Now, before we go any further, I think it's helpful to remind ourselves that the bigger goal in this series of presentations is not so much to look at the interpretation of James or what this passage means, but rather to see our presentations as yet another illustration of a reformed hermeneutic. Or as they sometimes say, we're going to take our reformed hermeneutic out for another test drive. We're going to apply that hermeneutic on this particular passage. And so although we're going to learn a lot of hopefully interesting and challenging things about James chapter 2, the bigger goal is to see how again we ought to approach scripture from a grammatical, a literary, a historical, and theological perspective. Now before I introduce the problem of this passage, let's hear what the text says. So James 2, 14 to 26. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, Go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there is one God? Good. But even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish man, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, quote, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by what he does, and not by faith alone. In the same way was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off on a different way. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. The word of the Lord. Now James, this passage within James, has had a long history in the church, and it's been a controversial one, and it's centered over this problem, and that is the perception, at least, that James contradicts what Paul writes. And you can see that tension most clearly if you take James chapter 2, verse 24. He says, you see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. And you contrast that with this statement from Paul in Romans 3, 28. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from observing the law. Now, there have been a number of answers or responses to this apparent contradiction between James and Paul, and so I give them to you as an illustration of how, I guess, the history of the church has wrestled with this particular passage. One of the more familiar examples comes from Martin Luther. Luther did not like the letter of James as a whole. Luther, of course, had his uh, special theme. He believed the heart of the gospel was salvation by grace through faith in Christ Jesus. And he looked high and low in James and he couldn't find it anywhere. And as a result, he called James as a whole a, a letter of straw, right? It was a theologically wimpy or lightweight letter. It lacked the gravitas, the seriousness, the substance, the weight of the true gospel. And as a result, uh, Luther didn't think that James maybe should even be in the canon. Now, if James didn't like, uh, if Luther didn't like James as a whole, there was one passage he especially didn't like, and that's the one we're looking at in this series of presentations, James chapter 2, 14 to 26. Because here, Luther thought that he not only, that is, James, lacked the gospel, he contradicted Paul. In fact, Luther was so sure of that, he said that if someone could come along and solve this contradiction between Paul and James, he said, why, I'll let them take my professor's hat, right, and call me a fool. Well, I don't know if I need another professor's hat, but I want at the end of this presentation to hopefully convince you that 
that James doesn't contradict Paul and that I've solved the problem that Luther thought existed and that I've, so to say, stolen his professor's head and with some respect, nevertheless, called him a fool. Another example of a problematic answer or response to the James text is uh, illustrated by this liberal scholar, uh, right, this German scholar. It's a few years ago who states this. He says, the statements of James cannot be brought into harmony with the authentic Paul, and what we confront is not only a tension, but an antithesis, right? A, a, a diametrically opposed uh, conflict between these two biblical authors. A third example comes from James, or as we've affectionately called him in this course, uh, and others do typically refer to him as Jimmy, James or Jimmy Dunn. He wrote a book on unity and diversity in the New Testament a number of years ago, and notice his statement. He says, it is obvious then that what is reflected here, that is in James, is a controversy within Christianity between that stream of Jewish Christianity, which was represented by James at Jerusalem on the one hand, and the Gentile churches or Hellenistic Jewish Christians who had been decisively influenced by Paul's teaching on the other. So Dunn reads James and says, aha, right, I see and hear conflict, division within the early church, division between the Jewish wing, represented by James in this passage, and the Gentile wing, represented by Paul in his various letters. A fourth example comes from the broader evangelical community, and it's something called the Lordship Salvation Debate. This debate happened a few years ago, but um, I think uh, many people in those communities are still aware, uh, well aware of it. And uh, the issue had to do with whether Jesus was your Savior or your Lord. And James 2, uh, 14 to 26, played a key role in that debate. So what did that de debate, debate involve? Well, apart from James now for a moment, uh, there was one side that was worried about um, Christians emphasizing the law or obedience or works of the law in such a way that they might be guilty of legalism or works righteousness. And so they really wanted to affirm and stress the free nature of God's grace. You can see that here, for instance, in this one title, right? It's not just free, but absolutely free, really stressing the free and undeserved nature of God's gift of grace. And in order to receive that gift, they claimed, all you have to do is proclaim Jesus as your Savior, right? You recognize your sin, you acknowledge Jesus as the one who can deliver you or save you from that sin, and that's all that is needed. But there were others who accused such statements of, well, the usual phrase was cheap grace, or sometimes in this title you can see it was described as easy believism. In other words, um, these are Christians who worry that there are way too many people out there who can say, right, verbally acknowledge Jesus as their Savior, but they don't do what Jesus tells them to do. They don't live as if Jesus is their Savior. And so these are folks who claim that it wasn't enough to believe that Jesus is your Savior. You also have to believe and proclaim and live as if Jesus is your Lord, right? Kurios is a title in which you know, there's a, a king, a ruler, some powerful person under which you are subservient. And so James, of course, then became a big, um, uh, a big text in these debates because if you were a lordship salvation guy or gal, right? If you were one of this camp, then you loved James, right? You would kind of throw James chapter 2 in the face of the other side and say, look, James has no tolerance at all for people who have only talk, right? He wants to see action. He stresses deeds. And then this text also had to be discussed then by the other side, maybe in a defensive way, but they had to still explain how on the one hand they were still right about emphasizing the free and undeserved nature of God's grace, but yet how can we make sense of James and his emphasis seemingly on works? Now, these are just four examples, right, of how people are wrestling with the text that we're wrestling with. And I propose that we enter into this debate, we try to solve the so-called problem of James chapter 2 by approaching this passage as we should approach any passage, namely from a grammatical, 
literary, historical, and theological perspective. And so we'll take a short break and we'll begin that process in just a moment. <laughs> 